In this IGCSE chemistry topic, we're going to be looking at amounts of substances. We might need to work out how much of our products we can make when we do a reaction, or how much of each of our reactants we would need to use, for example. But we're going to have to think about what we mean by how much. Before we go any further, we need to be sure that we understand that atoms of different elements contain different numbers of protons, neutrons and electrons, are different sizes and have different masses. The average mass of an atom of any particular element is called its relative atomic mass, and this value is given in the periodic table. It will be the larger of the two values for that type of atom. Check using the key on the periodic table if you're not sure. Because atoms are so small, it's not convenient to use grams to measure their mass. So instead, we use the mass of an atom of carbon-12 as our standard, and compare the masses of other atoms to this. When we do a reaction, we want to be able to measure out the correct proportions of each reactant according to the balanced equation. For example, if we're reacting hydrogen with nitrogen to make ammonia, then we need three hydrogen atoms for every nitrogen atom. But that doesn't mean we can weigh out three grams of hydrogen for every one gram of nitrogen, because the nitrogen atoms are much heavier than hydrogen atoms. Chemists realised early in the 1800s that if they measured out a mass of an element equivalent to its relative atomic mass in grams, then they'd have exactly the same amount of atoms of that element as if they'd measured out the relative atomic mass in grams of any other element. This quantity became known as the mole, and is the official SI unit of amount of substance. Time is measured in seconds, distance in metres, and amount in moles. The unit for moles is written as mole. This important idea of a mole of a substance works for compounds as well as for elements. The relative formula mass of a compound is the sum of the relative atomic masses of the atoms in it according to its chemical formula. Water has the chemical formula H2O, so its relative formula mass is 2 times the relative atomic mass of hydrogen plus the relative atomic mass of oxygen, which is 2 times 1 plus 16, which is 18. This means that one mole of water weighs 18 grams. If we work out the relative formula mass of any other compound and weigh out that mass, we have one mole of that substance. So if we want the same amount of different substances, then we need to have the same number of moles of each. This means we often have to convert between mass of something and moles of something. We can do this easily if we work out the relative formula mass by adding the relative atomic masses of all the atoms in the formula. For example, magnesium chloride has the formula MgCl2, so its relative formula mass is 24 for the Mg and 2 times 35.5 for the 2Cl, which is 95. So we now know that the molar mass of magnesium chloride is 95 grams per mole. If we want to know a mass of magnesium chloride, we multiply the number of moles by 95. So the mass of 3 moles of magnesium chloride is 3 times 95, which equals 285 grams. If we want to know how many moles of magnesium chloride we have, we divide the mass by 95. So 19 grams of magnesium chloride would be 19 divided by 95, which is 0.2 moles. It's well worth doing some practice. Here are some compounds with their chemical formulae. Work out the relative formula mass of each. When you've done that, use the relative formula masses to answer the questions. Pause the video now. How did you get on? Here are the answers. Make sure that you check any you got wrong and that you understand why they were wrong before continuing. We've discussed how a mole of one substance is the same amount as a mole of any other substance, but we ought to know how much a mole actually is. We know that a dozen eggs is 12 eggs, and that a dozen elephants is 12 elephants and that a dozen elephants don't weigh the same as a dozen eggs, even though we have the same amount. In the same way, a mole of eggs would be the same number as a mole of elephants. 
and the same as the number of atoms in a mole of each of these elements and the number of water molecules in a mole of water. Atoms are very, very small and so the number of atoms in a mole is very, very large. 6 times 10 to the power of 23 or 6 followed by 23 zeros. It's an almost unimaginably large number, far more than the number of galaxies in the observable universe, and that's just in a mouthful of water. This number is called Avogadro's number, after Amadeo Avogadro, whose work in the early 1800s led to the idea that a mole of any substance contained the same number of particles of that substance. Avogadro's number is used to convert between moles of a substance and the actual number of particles of that substance. For example, if we need to know how many atoms there are in 5 moles of magnesium, we need to multiply 5 moles by Avogadro's number and we get 3 times 10 to the 24 atoms. Similarly, if we know how many particles of a substance we have, for example a million water molecules, then we can work out how many moles that is. We divide the number of particles, a million, by Avogadro's number, and we get 1.66 recurring times 10 to the minus 18, which we've rounded to 1.7 times 10 to the minus 18. So now we can convert between moles and mass, and between moles and the numbers of atoms and molecules. If we use both of these together, we can work out the mass of one molecule of water, or we can work out how many molecules there are in one drop of water, which weighs about 0.05 grams. Pause the video and have a go at working these out. Let's have a look at the working for each of these problems. If we want to get from number of water molecules to mass of water, then we first have to work out how many moles of water we have. Moles equals number of water molecules, which is 1, divided by Avogadro's number. So we have 1.6 recurring times 10 to the minus 24 moles of water. Now we can go from moles to mass. Mass of water equals moles of water times the relative formula mass of water, which we worked out earlier was 18. So the mass of one water molecule is 3 times 10 to the minus 23 grams. To get from mass of water to number of molecules, we have to reverse the process. First, we go from mass to moles. So moles of water in one drop equals mass of 0.05 grams divided by the relative formula mass, which is 18, giving 2.77 recurring times 10 to the minus 3 moles. Then we convert moles to number of molecules by multiplying moles of water by Avogadro's number. When we do this, we find that one drop of water contains 1.66 recurring times 10 to the 21 water molecules. With these tools in place, we're ready to do a variety of different chemistry calculations. One of the simplest we need is to work out what percentage of the total mass of a substance comes from a specified type of atom in that substance. For example, iron is obtained from the ore hematite, which is iron 3 oxide. We need to know what percentage of the iron 3 oxide is iron if we want to know how much iron we'll get from a certain mass of the ore. In general, the percentage by mass of an element X in a compound is given by the number of atoms of X in the formula times the relative atomic mass of X divided by the relative formula mass of the compound. This then needs to be multiplied by 100 to make it into a percentage rather than a fraction of the total mass. Iron 3 oxide has the formula Fe2O3 so we need to look up the relative atomic masses of iron and oxygen and work out that the relative formula mass of Fe2O3 is equal to 160. Now we can work out the percentage of iron. We have two Fe's in the formula, so the mass of the iron is 2 times 56. We divide this by the relative formula mass of the iron oxide to get 0 0.70 and multiply this by 100 to express it as a percentage, 70%. 
Here's the percentage composition of the sugar sucrose, which has the formula C12H22O11. Pause the video and prove that you can work out the percentage of carbon, the percentage of hydrogen and the percentage of oxygen correctly. Now that we can work out the percentage of an element in a compound, we can apply this to find what mass of that element we would have in a certain mass of the compound. In general, mass of an element x equals percentage of the element x divided by 100 to express it as a fraction, times the total mass of the compound. Going back to our iron ore example, we showed that iron 3 oxide is 70% iron. So if we had 50 tonnes of iron 3 oxide, then it contains 70% of 50 tonnes, which is 35 tonnes of iron. Solar electrolysis is thought to be one of the main future methods of producing hydrogen to replace fossil fuels. For practice, work out the mass of hydrogen that could be obtained by electrolysis of 1000 grams of water. First you'll have to work out the percentage by mass of hydrogen in the water, then you'll need to use that percentage to work out the mass of hydrogen in the water. Pause the video whilst you have a go. Check your working with the answer here. Here are some more examples for you to check that you can use percentage composition effectively. Pause the video whilst you work through these. Many ionic substances contain water as part of the crystal, arranged regularly along with the ions in a giant 3D repeating structure. There will be a fixed number of water molecules for each set of ions in the structure. We call these water of crystallization, and we refer to substances having this as hydrated. The presence of water of crystallization is denoted in the chemical formula by adding a dot then the number of water molecules after the formula for the ionic substance. If the water of crystallization is removed, which can be done by heating the crystals, then we refer to them as being anhydrous. We usually see a colour change too when hydrated crystals are heated and the water is driven off. Of course the presence of the water increases the mass of the crystals so when we work out the molar mass, which is the relative formula mass in grams, we need to add the mass of the atoms of the water as well as the masses of the ions. For example, for copper sulphate we need to add 63.5 for the copper ion, 32 for the sulphur and 4 times 16 for the 4 oxygen atoms. Then we need to add 5 times 18 for the hydrogen and oxygen in the water of crystallization, giving 249.5 as the relative formula mass, which means that the mass of one mole of hydrated copper sulphate is 249.5 grams. For practice, pause the video and work out the mass of one mole of each of these hydrated substances. Here are the molar masses for you to check your answers against. In the same way we worked out percentage composition previously, we can be asked to work out the percentage of water in a hydrated substance. The process is much like we used before, and in this case we multiply the number of water molecules by the relative formula mass of water to get the mass of all the atoms in the water and divide this by the mass of all the atoms in the hydrated substance, in other words, the relative formula mass of the substance. And finally, we multiply by 100 to turn the fractional mass into a percentage. For example, our hydrated copper sulphate has 5 water molecules times 18 for the relative formula mass of water, divided by 249, which was the relative formula mass of the hydrated copper sulphate we worked out earlier. This comes to 0.36, so when we multiply by 100 we get 36% water in the crystals. 
a common experimental method for finding out how many waters of crystallization a hydrated substance contains is to measure the mass loss when the substance is heated to drive off all the water. If we also know the mass of the anhydrous material left behind, we can work out the amount of water and amount of anhydrous material left. Remember, amounts are measured in moles, and the ratio of the amount of water to the amount of anhydrous material will be the number of waters of crystallization in the formula of the hydrated substance. Here are the results from doing this kind of experiment. The first thing to do is to work out the mass of water driven off by subtracting the final from the initial mass of the substance in the test tube. Then we need to work out the relative formula masses of the anhydrous material, in this case copper sulphate, and of the water. Now we can convert the mass of the anhydrous copper sulphate and of the water into moles by dividing by their relative formula masses. Laying this out in a table as shown here can keep the calculation tidy. Finally, we want to work out how many waters of crystallization were present. We do this by dividing moles of water by moles of the anhydrous copper sulphate. I've laid this out as a ratio in my table so that you can see how many moles of water there are for each mole of copper sulphate. This is what's reflected in the chemical formula for the hydrated substance. The kind of chemical formula we are familiar with tells us which atoms are in the substance and how many of each. In fact, this type of chemical formula is called a molecular formula, and there are other kinds. One of the simplest kinds of chemical formula is called the empirical formula. This tells us only which types of atoms are present and in what ratio to one another. For some substances, such as water, this will be the same as the molecular formula. But for any substance where all the numbers in the molecular formula can be divided by something, the empirical formula will be different. Ethane has two carbon atoms and six hydrogen atoms. Both these numbers will divide by two, so the empirical formula for ethane is CH3. In the same way, the C6H12O6 of glucose becomes CH2O, Benzene becomes just CH, and hydrazine NH2. The reason we use empirical formulae is that we can do experiments which tell us the percentage composition, or percentage by mass, of each of the elements in a compound, and from these we can work out the compound's empirical formula using null ratios. One such experiment involves burning a known mass of magnesium until all of it has become magnesium oxide and measuring the mass of magnesium oxide formed. This is not trivial to do because we need to let oxygen in to keep the magnesium burning, but when we do so, magnesium oxide can escape as smoke. We have to keep heating the magnesium until the mass doesn't change anymore to make sure all the magnesium has reacted. Here are the results of such an experiment. The first thing we need to do is calculate the mass of the oxygen that was added from the air by subtracting the original mass of the magnesium from the final mass of the magnesium oxide. We'll also need to subtract the mass of the crucible and the lid from each of these, but I haven't shown that here. From here our calculation looks just like the one we did for waters of crystallization. We list the mass of each type of atom and divide by its relative atomic mass to see how many moles of each atom were involved in making the magnesium oxide. The mole ratio we can see here is 1 to 1. So the empirical formula of magnesium oxide has 1 magnesium to 1 oxygen. If we weren't sure what the ratios were, we'd divide all the moles by the smallest number of moles, 0.05 here, to get whole numbers. Often we're simply given composition information and asked to work out the empirical formula. The method is exactly the same as we've just done, even if there are more types of atom present. Composition data 
can be given as the percentage of each element instead of the mass of each element. We just treat the percentage as if it were a mass and the calculation works in exactly the same way. Occasionally we'll be given percentages of some of the elements present and expected to know that all the percentages have to add up to 100% to work out the percentage of the remaining element. So don't panic if you have a substance with three types of atom and are only given two percentages. When we divide the number of moles of each atom by the smallest number of moles to get the mole ratio, sometimes we don't get whole numbers. This can be due to rounding errors in the masses we were given or in our calculations. These will result in numbers which are very close to whole numbers and these should be rounded up or down to get a whole number. For example, 2.997 will be rounded up to 3 and 4.0017 will be rounded down to 4. Alternatively, we sometimes see numbers which are really fractions. If our mole ratio came out as 1 to 1.5, for example, we would not round the 1.5 up or down. It's clearly not nearly a whole number. Instead, we should recognise that 1.5 is 1 and a half. So we get rid of the half by multiplying everything by 2, so the correct ratio would be 2 to 3. Here are two practice examples to work through. Make sure you can get the right answer for each of these using the method that we've learned. Pause the video whilst you work on these. Now we know how to work out an empirical formula, it would be very useful to be able to convert this to a molecular formula so that we can see how many of each atom are actually present in the molecule. If we know the relative formula mass of our molecule we can do this. Remember that the empirical formula is the simplest whole number ratio. All we have to work out is what number to multiply everything in the empirical formula by to get the molecular formula. So if we add up all the relative atomic masses of the atoms in the empirical formula and then divide the relative formula mass by this we have a scaling factor. This is the amount we need to multiply the empirical formula by. For example if our empirical formula is NO2 and we are told that the relative formula mass of this oxide of nitrogen is 92 then we add up N and two O's which is 46 and then divide 92 by 46 to get a scaling factor of 2. Then we multiply 1n and 2 o's by 2 to get N2O4 as the molecular formula. Have a go at working out these molecular formulae. Pause the video whilst you work them out. These are the answers you should have got. Before we look at how moles are used to work out amounts of products made or amounts of reactants needed, we first need to be confident about the information in balanced chemical equations. Firstly, we should appreciate that the numbers that we put in front of the chemical formula in an equation are numbers of moles. If we read the equation here, we should read 2 moles of hydrogen react with 1 mole of oxygen to make 2 moles of water. Note that whilst I've shown the 1 in front of the oxygen here, we don't normally write a number in front if the number of moles is 1. Any formula without a number in front in an equation implies 1 mole of that substance. The other important thing to realise is that the numbers in front for balancing are not part of the formula of the substance. Water is H2O, not 2H2O. And this matters when we come to work out relative formula masses. The relative formula mass of water is 18, not 36. Just for practice, write the relative formula mass of each of the reactants and products in these two chemical equations. Pause the video whilst you do this. Now check you got the relative formula masses correct and didn't multiply by any of the numbers for balancing the equation. OK, now we have all the tools we need to be able to calculate reacting quantities. 
which is what we'll explore in part two.